it is now my pleasure to introduce you guys a chief scientist at the Omnitech Corporation. How about a nice big round of applause for Leland Lambert? go ahead and show you some demos up front so you can see what it looks like. This is the actual appliance. I brought a couple of them up here. You guys are too spread out to pass them around, but if you want to come up and look at one, feel free. Uh, this is a effort that I've been working on for about a year and a half. Uh, I was at the conference here last year. It sort of galvanized the vision in my mind. My goal was to take commodity hardware, low cost and well supported and make a Nagio server out of it that we could hang in a server room out in the field somewhere. Whether it's a, a, a shed that has telecom equipment in it, whether it's a customer premise that has 20 servers. The idea is to hang one of these on the wall. It has a video camera, the Pi video camera. I build temperature probes for them on the side. Basically, it gives us a picture of what's going on in that server room at any point in time. This is the one in our server room in the shop. As you can tell, we don't use a lot of light. <laughs> and this Mac is driving me fruit. I hate it that you can't double tap. Uh, it is a server room, I can tell you for sure, because these are lights on ray drives, and that little blue light up on top is a little cloud server I put in a couple months ago. This is another one. It's actually a downtown St. Louis in a server room. This is one we built for our customer. It's about 80 degrees down there. Uh, the temperature probe isn't quite as accurate as it could be on the box because the box is reading the temperature of the box and that box is a little bit higher than ambient. It's probably three or four degrees, but it's close enough. Um, at some point, you know, we could put in a correction factor. Notice it is refreshing every second. So this is actually ta taking a still generated dynamically every second and a half and uploading it, or you can download it rather, and look at what's going on. Um, I hung this unit from the overhead rail. It's looking down. Oh, uh, where's my pointer? You know, this is the cage coming in. That's the door cage. This is the aisle in front of the server racks. There's two racks there, an open rack here. And basically, it shows you what's going on if there's anybody in there primarily. The owner of this company likes to go to this page and watch it all, you know, whenever he feels like. It really surprised him, though, the first time he went there at 10 o'clock at night and the lights were off. Well, if there's nobody in there, it doesn't trip the motion sensors and the lights go out, at, go out at, at, after some period at night. Anyway, as we said, my name's Lee. I'll be around at the conference. I've got a couple of these to look at. If you want to, feel free email and Twitter. As I said, the basic problem is remote sites, multiple remote sites, 50, 60, 80, 100. Uh, the whole idea is to monitor those sites in a low cost manner. If one of these boxes fail, throw it away, we send another one, you don't have to worry about it. You know, it's not a $10,000 server or even a $2,000 box. Does anybody know what a pie costs? 35 bucks, plus a power supply, a case, an SD card, and a camera. Less than 100 bucks total. You're not talking a lot of money. They're basically throwaways. The whole value of the unit is in what's on the SD card. So what do you do with remote sites? Well, the next question is, what do you do with them? We needed to both have a local Nagios instance in most cases, it's for a customer site where you want the customers to be able to log in and see their Nagios view at any point in time on the Raspberry Pi. That's what I was showing you there a few minutes ago. But if there's a problem, if there's an alert, 
We want those alerts to forward to a central site so we can dispatch. Make sense? We call them server room monitors, SRM. So what, the, what, what it says on the box, we talked about the hardware. I'll show you a little more about the hardware. We'll talk about the software build, configuring the software for the Nagios, the base install. We'll talk about the network issues involved. And finally, I'll go through the Nagios configuration and show you some ways to test it. We're based in St. Louis. We specialize in open source solutions, open source and free software. We deal primarily with core IT infrastructure, web servers, mail servers, some file and print. Uh, we got an Agio six or seven years ago when I built the first one for our shop, and I, I love the environment. It's so flexible, and for, for posterity, for Ethan, if he ever watches the tape, I love the job these guys are doing at Nagios. You know, they have figured out how to manage both the commercial side, make enough money to keep the company going, as well as the open source side, and that is pretty unique in industry. So again, Ethan, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Last year I gave a talk on multi-platform Nagios. Back then, the idea was you got a central Nagios server, every server out in the field has an SSH tunnel to it. Works great, except when you've got 15 or 20 on a single site, it is not very efficient. So, the solution, hardware-wise. Raspberry Pi, this is a B model, or a B plus. There are two or three other models out there we'll see in a minute. I include the camera because I want to be able to show a view of the server room. Turns out it's no big deal. Another 25 bucks you add in, add in the case. There aren't a lot of uh, good ways to mount it, though. There aren't any cases that come with a camera unless you're talking monsters. So basically, I took these cases, which are made by a company in England called Syntec, drill a hole for the camera, and hot glue them in. I guess if you melt the hot glue, you're going to melt the case anyway, so it's probably not a bad, you know, it's not a big issue with doing it that way. If you've never seen a Pi, right here is where the SD card mounts. One of the nice things about Syntec is you have a cover that comes with it. Put the SD card in, screw the back on. You know, it's a fairly robust uh, you know, piece of hardware. You can throw them around, you're not going to hurt anything. Different models. This is the A down here on the bottom. Model A is the original one, quarter, quarter gig of RAM. Was it, I think, 200 megahertz CPU on the uh, ARM chip? It's not used much anymore. It was superseded years ago with the Model B, uh, Rev 1, and Rev 2. The nice thing about the Pi, well, may or may not be the nice thing, they originally came with any connection you could want. You've got an HDMI connection. In fact, for about five seconds, I thought about booting up one of the pies and doing a presentation off that, but I don't ever leave our office on them. Ethernet jack, two USB, audio out, RCA output, and here's your other critical component, GPIO. That's where you run the temperature probe or any other I.O. you need directly in that remote environment. Model B has been around for about three years now. It's been the mainstay. A few months ago, the B Plus was released. Same basic hardware specs, except the board is cleaned up. Number one, it actually has mounting holes in it, so you can screw it, out, screw it down to standoffs in a case if you want to. Number two, who needs an RCA video out? I mean, that went away 20 years ago, as far as I know. The only reason it was there on the original one is for the ed educational market. The original Pi design was for the idea of you send a thousand of them to British Ghana, you give them to the kids, they're more likely to have an old TV with an RCA jack than they are a modern monitor with VGA or even HDMI. 
So that's why it was there. It goes away into B+. There is also a compute module out today. Compute, compute model, module came out a couple years ago. It's designed for embedded use of the Pi in another system. Does that uh, hardware look a little bit familiar to anybody? It's a sodium slot, or a dim slot, memory, memory slot. Takes the same physical connection. Uh, I haven't played with one. I think you can actually use them in place of a memory chip if your system can be so configured. The camera, little bitty circuit board, has about a eight inch ribbon cable on it. Connector right behind the ethernet plug, plug it in, it works. You know, so far, I haven't had any problems with the camera. Temperature probe is another issue. The Pi marketplace has always been educational. By the way, that was one of the big reasons I chose the Pi platform, because if you want to build one, there's 100 different tutorials, text, YouTube videos, et cetera, on how to put one together, how to run a Python script, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's tons of support in the general marketplace. You know, so if you want to build one, you don't have to bring in an IT consultant to do it. Any electronics person can put it together for you. I wanted something that was mass market. It was well supported in the community. Uh, the other thing, oh, I'm sorry. One of the things I forgot to mention about the B, B plus, the only major complaint that I have seen about the B model is the fact that the video system is proprietary. It's a, you know, it's a binary blob you have to get from the Raspbian Foundation. The advantage of the B plus, ostensibly, it hasn't really been tested in the marketplace yet, is the fact it supports OpenGL. The video system is open source. And so people can write whatever code they want to with it. That features into some of our, that factors into some of the future plans I'll talk about here in a few minutes. Temperature probe I use is the, it's called a one wire temperature probe. It's a temperature probe and a serial transceiver, basically. It uses one I.O. pin. The problem is to use one I.O. pin, you have to have three. You have to have ground, you have to have power, and you have to have I.O. So it tends to be a little bit cumbersome, but I've gotten used to building them. It takes me about 10, 15 minutes to build one. I do them four, or five, six at a time. And just hanging out the GPIO slot on the side of the case. Works great. If you wanted something a little fancier, DHT11 is a temperature slash humidity probe. It is more sophisticated. You can get them in a module with an Ethernet jack if you want to, or a module with a six foot cord. If you were doing something in a critical server room, it might be worth moving that direction. Excuse me because it's going to give you better temperature accuracy, as well as by separating it from the Pi, you remove the near effect heat load that the Pi generates itself. Again, it's like three or four degrees. It hasn't been a big deal at this point. The main purpose of the temperature sensor is to tell you if the air conditioning failed. So if it goes above 95 degrees, I mean, that's, that's an easy check to trap. And you know, we've done checks to do that. Here's the unit. Again, there's another one up here if anybody wants to take a look at it. <coughs> Camera mounted right there in the middle. SD card plugs in on the top because that's the way I hang them on the wall. And by the way, that's why I put the logos on her that way so you don't hang them on the wall upside down. Because, I mean, wouldn't somebody looking at a picture of the server room upside down would be Something, something they're going to complain about right off the bat. Temperature sensor we use, status lights. Main purpose is the status lights to tell you if the system's running or not. When you plug it in, you get the power light. You'll see a link light if you have the cable plugged in, 100 meg light if you have a 100 megabit connection. But the activity light is the most important one to watch. When you plug it in, it'll flash once. A few seconds later, it'll flash again. And then it'll start flashing a lot when it's doing the bootload. 
that tells you it's alive. Any questions about the hardware? All right, building software for the Pi. Raspian.org is the home site, the main site. I was going to switch over and show you the sites, but given the fact that I'm working with strange machines here, I'm not going to take the time to do it at this point. No telling how long it would take. Uh, these links are fairly common. Uh, you know, the guys have a copy of the presentation. It'll go out with the proceedings for the meeting. If you have any questions, you know, shoot me an email. I'll be glad to help you out. The version of Raspbian for the Pi is actually a two-step process. Raspbian creates the OS image, the Raspberry Pi Foundation publishes it, and they add some tweaks and stuff like that to it. Anybody know why I'm going with Raspbian? I.O. and camera. They have the drivers built in. Okay. And also it's, it's pure Debian. Minimum, the minimum install is like 400 meg, even with, all, even with all the stuff they give you, like X Windows. And if you use a, even a 4 gig SD card, there's tons of room. I always use 8 gig and save the second 4 gig for backups if we need them. So Raspbian is the name of the image. You get it from the Raspberry Pi Foundation slash downloads. Or most vendors where you get a Pi will sell you an 8 gig SD card with it for an extra five or six bucks. <clears throat> gets you the card, gets you the image, and saves you the trouble having to load your original card. Once you boot it up, though, the first thing you do is update. Because there's no telling how old the image is you have. You want to be fairly current, especially when you start building Core 4, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Some other packages you need for Nagios. You need PHP to run the web interface. You need PHP 5, PHP 5 common, sorry about that, and CLI. When you install them, there is a conflict with Apache 2 worker tasks. They'll be replaced, don't worry about it. I like check config since I'm a command line person. I've been doing command line for 20 years. I just don't like GUIs unless I have to do a word processing document or a presentation or something like that. So everything I do is at the command line. Check config is what you use to enable Nagios to start automatically when the system boots up. Telnet is a troubleshooting tool I use. If you want to check the, NAS, the uh, NSCA port, Telnet to it. Now I'll give you some other checks here in a few minutes. If you want to build the status map.cgi, you will have to have GD libraries. So you want to install libgd2-dev because it'll compile into Nagios core, and then you'll have your pretty status map. Now, this little remote, for Nagios, you don't need it. But for a lot of other applications, you're going to want to get email out of, out of that guy. So that's why you use MailX and SSMTP. This gives you basic email capability out of the Pi. MailX is a mail user agent that gives you a mail command. SSMTP enables you to forward to a smart host, either a local mail server or you can con configure it to use Gmail. <clears throat> How many have your Nagios machines forwarding email through your car corporate mail server? Okay, anybody see a problem with that? What if the mail server crashes? If we have a priority Nagios instance, I always configure to use Gmail. Because then the check notices will get out <coughs> even if the corporate mail server is down. All right, need a few more components for GPIO. W1 GPIO and W1 Therm. Remember before I said this is one of the big reasons I chose the Raspbian platform. The kernel modules are built in. All you have to do is install them. <clears throat> if you're testing, you're building it in a lab, you want to play with it, you can use Mod Probe to install it manually or drop them in Etsy modules when you reboot the Pi. 
they'll install automatically. When you install it, the ID on that temperature sensing device is unique to the machine. This threw me for, for a little bit until I figured out how to, you know, what was going on. You might tell me what the system directory is on a Linux machine. Come on, guys, nobody knows what a system directory is? It's all of the real-time data about the kernel operation. If a device is detected in hardware, there's a link for it, or there's an entry for it somewhere under slash sys. In this case, it's sys, <coughs> bus, and that's where GPIO goes. W1, one wire device, and then you will see an ID that looks like this. That's where you get the data for the temperature that it's reading. So that's, so that's the ID on this particular device. Uh, it's not that hard. Um, I don't remember putting it in the slides. There's about a 20 line program in PHP code we did to extract the data. If you want a copy of it, email me. I'll be happy to send you a copy of it. They need a startup script. Raspy still, again, part of Raspbian. One of the reasons I start with it. I store the image and user local Nagio share temp snapshot.jpg. That's the image that displays on that screen, full screen, are minimized. Every second it updates a picture of the picture of the server room. You also want to start the daemon. NSCA, we'll talk more about that when we get to the, NAS, the Nagios config. If one of these pies is out in the field, on a customer site, in a machine, you know, one machine room, <clears throat> I always envision a cell tower. You've got a 10 by 20 foot box at the bottom of the tower with all the, all the equipment in it. I always think of one of these hanging in that box out there in the middle of nowhere or their person goes by once a month to make sure there's enough gas in the backup generator. You know, what, what happens if you need to do maintenance? There's nobody to go out there. There's nobody there. It's cost prohibitive to send somebody there. Just like last year when I set up tunnels to every monitored machine, in this case, I set up an SSH tunnel to each SRM. It gives me shell access to the box. I can log in. I can make any Nagios tweaks I need to. I can also set up an update if I want to, because I have all of the Nagios components in a, in a repository. All I have to do is push a pull command out to the unit. It's updated in a few seconds. And then obviously you have to call that SRM start shell script whenever the pie starts up. OK, that's the system. Now let's talk about Nagios. I started using Nagios core on this for a couple of reasons. You know, A, the Nagios crew did such a great job Last year, I was impressed with the architecture. Makes sense. B, <clears throat> it's more efficient than Nagios 3, it's less resource intensive. It's going to be a lot better on a 400 megahertz Raspberry Pi than Nagios 3 would be. C, it's new. The repositories are accessible. They are updated on a regular basis. I don't have to wait for a package to come out and install from a package. I can pull updates down weekly if I want to and install them. When you configure, uh, anybody not comfortable with the source build process, building a system from source, it's really not that complicated. So if you are, try it. There's only a few commands you have to know. 
you have to configure and make two commands. In this case, you want to configure with the graphics device libraries. Then you, then you want to make, you want to create all the binaries. And when you do a make install, that installs basic Nagios Core 4 on any machine from a source tree. Takes about five minutes on a Pi. Isn't bad. Only have to do it once. I do it on my development Pi. I push the update to the repository, and in a few seconds I can pull it to any SRM we have out in the field. Get pull SRM master. <clears throat> if you're doing a new install, you want to install a init script, an Etsy init D. You want to install Nagios command mode, and you want to install sample config. NSCA, same procedure. Configure and make, produces two binaries, the daemon and the client. Or the actual daemon is NSCA, the client is send NSCA. Uh, I, cop, I keep the binaries in libexec. You could also keep them in, sla in nagio slash bin. Either way is fine. And you also have a config. Now, the important part of using NSCA, the data is encrypted. When the data gets sent from the client to the server, you have to have a shared secret or password or key, whatever you want to call it. <coughs> that key can be auto-generated. I use LastPass. It's good at generating random keys. But that key has to be the same on both platforms. You also get to choose your encryption. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. It's also nice to have a set of plugins. Again, I only build it once, push, them, you know, push the update out to whatever, whatever units we have in the field. Easiest way to check it, go to the directory, run it. Even if you don't pass it parameters, it will run and give you back the header that says these are the ways you can call it. This is how you call it. <coughs> if you have other plugins, you build them on that environment. Linux, Windows, Mac. You know, when I started using Agios five or six years ago, the plugins were creepy. I didn't know how to build them. So I realized you pull down a source on a machine, set up a compile environment, build them. Take those executables, 32-bit, 64-bit, Linux, Windows, Mac, whatever, just copy them out to machines. Not a big deal. Don't be afraid of it. All right. Any questions on configuration so far? Now we'll pick up the chat <coughs> earlier about how you use in this case, SRMs, and a central server across the network. <clears throat> the question is, the issue is, if this is a remote site, you've got a firewall on that remote site, or you better have a firewall on that remote site. Most, most corporations will do. That firewall is man managing traffic through the firewall. It's blocking inbound access on any port that's not authorized. It may be filtering traffic, et cetera. So the question is, how would an SRM hanging on the wall out here talk to a central Nagio server? Again, last year, I talked about an SSH tunnel from the central server to every one of 100 or 500 remote machines. <clears throat> that tunnel is not ideal from a, if nothing else, from a port standpoint. If you've got 10,000 remote machines, you don't want 10,000 tunnels up on your central server. You know, that's a heck of a lot of traffic going through the firewall, a lot of, you know, with active checks, you're using a lot of network traffic across those tunnels. It's just not ideal. It's not a good environment. It doesn't scale well. So the solution I decided to start using is NSCA. 
Nagio service check acceptor, Nagio service check adapter, depending on which definition you look at. Basically, NSCA forwards check results from the remote machine to the central, to the central server. It forwards whatever notifications that you configure. Services, hosts, you use a specific contact to forward to the central site. And the best part of it is it requires one open port at that central site. Unless you're blocking outbound traffic, you don't need to do anything here. All you need is one open port, default 5667, at the central site. And all of that encrypted data can easily pass from the remote unit to the central server. Now, how do you configure Nagios to do this? It's not that hard. 5667 is a standard port. All notifications are encrypted by default. I mentioned the password before. This is where you set it. You have to set the password and the encryption method the same on the central server as well as every remote site. You've got a number of choices for that encryption. Simple XOR is the default. Uh, we're not going to have time to go through these. Again, grab a copy of the slides or email me. I'll send you a copy of it. This is an example of a notify service alert by NSCA, notify host, host alert by NSCA. This is an example of the contact that you would use to forward those alerts to central dispatch. At the central site, the checks you configured, passive check one, active check zero. And remember, the host name and service description must be the same on both ends. Here's an example of a service template on that central server. Passive check on, active check off. A service using that, use passive service, host name. This is an example of a dummy definition which you can use with this Perl script to test. You don't, even, you don't even have to use Nagios to test it on the SRM. This little Perl script enables you to push an alert through NSCA and test whether the communication is working properly. Define a host name and a test service and your host destination. And send the command. And if it works, it, if it works, you get a uh, yes. If it doesn't work, uh, it tells you it doesn't work. Troubleshooting tips. Nagios logs, Apache error logs. Uh, verify your UI user permissions. So what we built, right, what I built, what we do, what we use is a, I call it hierarchical, but distributed might be a more appropriate name, basically SRMs in the field reporting to a central server. Some of the things we're working on right now, <clears throat> that B plus hardware, since it is OpenGL, means that we now have a decent way to do motion video. Because one of the things I'd like to do is, is allow a motion video button on there so the president can log in at 10 o'clock at night and watch what's going on. And we can also set up zone minder. If something changes in that server room other than the lights going out, you can set up and send an alert. Somebody walks in and can send an alert. The other thing we're working on is adding a Nagios compatibility. Right now, there's some minor issues with Nagios 4 that I haven't worked out yet. But I would love to be able to have these SRMs in the field be configurable by that customer in the field. You know, with a little bit of guidance. All right. Sorry, the time was cut short. 
uh, I try to do is, I think we covered about everything. Questions? Uh, two, actually. The first one's going to be sure. really short. When can we buy these? Give me a call. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and a second, have you considered components like microphone, speaker, something like that, where you could do uh, remote hands assistance with somebody who's on site and kind of speak over their, their shoulder? Uh, I had not, but I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Okay, thanks. Uh, we use the Raspberry Pis for like a smoke ping slaves in off-site locations mm -hmm. like that. Um, I never thought about using a Nagios installation to do that, um, but I was curious if you ever thought about doing Mod Gearman with that, which is a, like a built-in distributed. H haven't had a need to at this point. I haven't played with Mod Gearman a lot, so uh, the service model we're talking about here is pure client server. A lot of these clients out in the field are different customers, mm -hmm. so there's no need for any views to be combined. So. Uh, and it, if they were all related, then yes, it might be useful to talk about Mod Gearman. Okay. Uh, follow up question, I guess, really. Sure. Um, oh, I had it. I lost it. <laughs> oh, they, uh, the GPIO for yes. the Raspberry Pis. I've used the Arduino. Is it similar to that? Like the programming for. for there there those? is a fundamental issue with the Arduino, it does not run a standard kernel. Right. No Apache, no email, no nothing except. You write a program and see to twiddle those I.O. points. So no, uh, I threw the Arduinos out initially because I, I needed a kernel, I needed a Renagios, I needed all the services that can be provided that way. Anybody else? Any additional questions? All right, how about a nice big round of applause one more time for Leland Lamberts. Thank you so much, Leland. We really appreciate it.